The UAE has rolled out the red carpet for Prime Minister Modi to inaugurate the sprawling Swami Narayan Mandir in Abu Dhabi. Constructed on a 27-acre plot of land, the temple is of stunning architectural marvel and amalgamation of modern aesthetics and spiritual iconography. It stands as a symbol of tolerance in the UAE. What is notab notable is that this is the first Hindu Mandir in the Middle East. We can even say that this stellar temple is a gesture of inclusion and harmony, a nod to the Indian diaspora in the UAE and a recognition of Hinduism as the third largest religion in the world. The inauguration of this Mandir is a milestone moment in the global Hindu renaissance. But does this now send a message of rejection of the two-nation theory in the Middle East as well. We take this conversation forward. I have with me Professor Madhav Nalapat. I also have with me Hindol Sen Gupta and Mr. Vedvi Raria with us on the broadcast as well. Let me begin this conversation with Hindol, if I may. Hindol, India-UAE ties have somewhere, uh, both the nations have found themselves to become more and more of organic and natural partners, given the changing uh, geostrategic developments across the globe. Given this circumstance, the UAE perhaps did not have to really make this gesture of a temple towards India. It uh, may not have impacted any business deals between the two nations. Uh, work would have gone on as it has been. But for the UAE, to then make this gesture, what really is the larger signal or message that is being sent, not just to the Indian community in the UAE, but to Indians here as well and to Hindus across the world? Well, it's very simple. Um, you know, the, after all, at the end of the day, the UAE wants to promote itself as the, you know, the change maker or the change bearer for a changing Middle East. And the Middle East is changing dramatically. Uh, and we forget that often sitting in India. It's a whole new Middle East emerging. And I think this Hindu temple is a great sign of that changing Middle East. Um, the Middle East is changing and becoming uh, far more you know, open than it ever used to be. And uh, you know, it, it, this temple gives us a sense of the direction in which the Middle East wants to move, especially UAE. And you will see it in other parts of the Middle East too. This is the moment to rejoice uh, and this is the moment where, you know, we will see much more of this happen in the Middle East, including in other parts of the Middle East. And we underestimate India at our own peril. I mean, here's a country which is going to be the third largest economy in the world. Better ties with it will always be helpful for the Middle East. Absolutely. Let me bring in Professor Madhav Nalapath into the conversation as well. Same question to you, sir. I'd just like to understand your perspective on this as well. The fact that this grand gesture is being made is this then a rejection of the two nation, you know, the, the sort of theory, rather, I don't want to call it the two nation theory, but what we have been told in the past that Hindus and Muslims cannot coexist, that there can't be peace and harmony, is this then a big rejection of the same theory by the Middle East as well? And what really then is the significance of that signaling? Because within India, we have, of course, been saying this for very long, and we continue to be a living and breathing example of how to coexist. But we have had in the past many forces trying to instill some sort of a fear regarding the religion of the other. Uh, Devika, I'm very glad NewsX has taken up this issue. The two-nation theory is an absurdity. It was created by the British and implemented uh, uh, by Muhammad Ali Jinnah. I'm really surprised that the Congress leaders uh, basically accepted it. Mahatma Gandhi had said he would accept partition only you know, over his dead body, and even the Mahatma accepted it. I personally, I think it was, a, uh, it was, a, it was almost a crime against humanity, partitioning the people of India. The fact is that the the, the countries in the Middle East have never subscribed to this two-nation theory. The, uh, uh, the Pakistan establishment for a very long time tried to feed that idea to them. You know, you are a very, you are a Muslim country. Why do you employ Hindus? Why do you employ Christians? 
why don't you employ only Muslims? In other words, only Pakistanis, frankly. And they used to keep on mentioning this and like a drumbeat. Now, of course, they are relatively more silent. But I remember 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I mean, everybody, every Pakistan in the Middle East, oh, for God's sake, why are you employing people who are not Muslims? What they meant was, don't employ Indians, employ uh, only we, Pakistanis. Because by that time, Pakistan had driven out almost all the minorities from there. The, none of the countries of the Middle East uh, did so. And countries like Kuwait, for example, they basically, you know, de facto did, uh, did not allow uh, 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 people from Pakistan to come and work because of the problems of law and order and pro uh, which they faced. Other countries also followed suit. But Indians have always been welcome. Indian Hindus, Indian Christians, Indian Muslims, they've all been welcomed without hesitation by the, uh, the different uh, governments of the Middle East. And that is a tribute to the fact that they refuse to subscribe to this absurd, noxious two-nation theory. Now, I want to say that, you know, I am... I mean, I am a, I am a Sanatani. Uh, I've been a Sanatani from birth. And I'm very proud of Sanatan Dharma. And I think one of the great things about Sanatan Dharma is its inclusivity. And that is where the Swami Narayan sect is so unique. Because it is extremely inclusive. There is no exclusivity whatsoever in the Swami Narayan sect. It completely embodies the spirit of Sanatan Dharma that the universal, it is a universal you know, a faith. And I think this temple exemplifies that, which is why it is so special. You know, there have been, you know, the rulers of Dubai, for example. Dubai has been an extremely forward-looking uh, uh, kingdom for a very long time. And that's the reason why from a desert island yeah. where people were basically, you know, uh, I mean, uh, just selling camels and that was their trade. Uh, and of course, smuggling gold. But the fact is that today what Dubai is because of smart policy, the same smart policy we're seeing in India since uh, 2014. And I'd like to say that this is a tribute to the, to the rulers uh, of Abu Dhabi, to the Al Naihan uh, family, the royal family of Abu Dhabi, who is also the president of the UAE. I think it's a tribute to the fact that they are accepting of the fact that we are all children of the same almighty. I think it's a very proud moment for us. And I would like to say, I think, you know, it is very clear that when I've been just watching visuals of, uh, of the stadium where uh, you know, citizens of India are congregating to welcome Prime Minister Modi. Prime Minister Modi is not the Prime Minister of the BJP. He's yes. not the Prime Minister of one community. He's the Prime Minister of all of India. And he's a friend of the whole world, except those countries who do not accept that friendship and who slap us and who try to slap us and hurt us. Barring those few countries, the prime minister is very much a voter of Vasteva Kutumbakam. So has so has become so is the UAE. And I think this is a very happy moment for for me, for, me, for example, as someone from Kerala, because for us in Kerala, the Middle East is our second home. Right. I mean, we feel very much at home in the Middle East. And it is a very happy moment for all of us. And you've seen Malayalis, you've seen people from Tamil Nadu, from Andhra, from Karnataka, from Uttar Pradesh, from Bengal, from Rajasthan. They've all come together, Hindus, Muslims, yes. Christians, Buddhists. We've all come together as Bhartiyas. It's truly a proud moment. Okay, I'll come back to you in just a moment, sir. Hindol also had his hand up before I bring in Mr. Vedvir Arya into the conversation. Hindol, go ahead. I just want to make a point. Sorry, you know, my doorbell kept ringing when you asked me the question. Look, I want to make this point, and I think Professor Nalapat will agree with me. We sitting in India, looking at our sort of ecosystem, don't understand that Islam itself at its very core, in its place of origin is changing. The, the UAE is changing. Saudi Arabia is changing. Kuwait is changing. 
Qatar has still some question marks, but overall, at its very origin, Islam is changing. Actually, one of the things we should celebrate is this change. And what you're seeing with this temple is a, is a physical manifestation of this change. If you go to Abu Dhabi today and you go to the Grand Mosque, the Zayed Mosque today, you will see at the entrance of the Zayed Mosque, they proclaim how great uh, the entire sort of pluralism of, of, of their land is they make it a point to shout that out right now there is a worrying strain here which is this the kind of uh, the as the middle east changes the virulent strains of extremism in islam are coming to our neighborhood so in the future it's not the middle east that will be the problem it will be our neighbors in south asia who are going to be a problem and we've seen that's that in the maldives hindul that's what we've seen in the maldives also Correct. in the re Absolutely. Uh, very recently that that's an example of what hindul is talking about of the radicalism then shifting from some of these nations uh, but at the same time hindul there is then that effort as you said which is being made to not have the middle eastern nations especially the saudis and the ua they don't want to necessarily now be painted as islamic oil rich nations and that's all that there is to them they're making that effort and one then has to of course acknowledge and appreciate the fact that an effort and a gesture is being made happening one of course as you correctly point out devika you know for the age of fossil fuels slowly coming to an end though it's very far away from the end i mean let me emphasize on that the us has become the world's biggest oil producer so we should keep all that context in mind but of course i think with with all the worry on climate change the middle eastern kingdoms realize that their future is something else than their present and there has to be a holistic push to embrace that future you know you would have heard of the neom project for instance it's an entire city that's being made in the desert as as you know as many old cities have been made in the middle east before it's an it's an exemplary architecture so they are embracing a sort of singaporean model so to speak should i say you know of change uh, in the future and this temple will go down in history as one of the biggest examples of that change now um, some of that change also helps the kingdoms they also want do not want radicals to finally turn towards them which is exactly what happened in pakistan which is exactly a, a to, to, uh, Osama bin Laden was not just threatening the US. Osama bin Laden, remember, first threatened his own countrymen and his own kingdom. So all of this has to be kept in mind. I think the Middle East is changing. In India, we must realize in our analysis and policy making, the problems are now in our neighborhood and we need to worry about that. But at the same time, we must entirely embrace that the Middle East is deeply changing. Okay, Vedvir Arya bringing into the conversation as well. If this is then the premise of a changing Middle East. And that narrative is now being set with the inauguration of a grand Hindu Mandir. I just like your thoughts uh, on the same question I'd ask Professor Nalapath as well. If then this is a rejection of uh, a two nation theory or of all the beliefs uh, that have been instilled in us in the very past that you have to fear the religion of the other, if that then comes to an end with some of these Middle Eastern nations making uh, these grand gestures of acceptance and tolerance, how does then India then need to build upon those relations further in terms of a people-to-people -people connect? Yes, Devika, it would be a greatest moment for, as a Sanatani for me, then our temple is going to be inaugurated tomorrow. But uh, I would uh, like to compliment the leaders of UAV they have taken such a great courage to allow a first temple to be constructed in the Middle East. I would like to say that this is the one of the greatest historical moment in the last thousand years because the entire Islamic narrative has to be changed. The way Professor Madhav Nalapatji just uh, told that we are all the children of one almighty, irrespective of the how you practice the religions. So that message because uh, last thousand years, one thousand years narrative of the Islam was that you cannot coexist or uh, you can't practice Islam without eliminating the other religions. That narrative has, has uh, that could, that will be, I think we will, uh, the, the, the end of that kind of a narrative has started right now. So this temple is actually going to 
uh, start the ending of that narrative. So this is very important uh, because uh, even anywhere in the world, uh, the Muslims are there, they have to realize that the coexistence is the only mantra and the inclusivity is the only the humanity, the way the humanity can survive and uh, flourish uh, loving each other. That message has to uh, not only just uh, verbally on uh, various shows, it is actually Islam has to imbibe those values. This is the first reform ever introduced in the Islam. What I say, the greatest reform is going to be in, in there. And uh, I would like to end my stay, one small couplet. What I generally say, Majhab badalne se maabap nahi badalte, ibadat badalne se sarhad nahi badalte, dharma granth badalne se bhagwan nahi badalte. So that message has to be given to everyone and this temple would be uh, giving this message to the every section of this world. Okay, Professor Nalapath, bringing you back into the conversations and just uh, taking forward what uh, you know Hindol and Bedvi Arya have also had to say. If there is then a tectonic shift that is taking place uh, within Islamic nations of what they want to be perceived as by the world and how they want their societies to transform. What is it as, in, as Hindol also pointed out, is there something that then we need to be a little bit careful about of where those radical elements and how the naysayers will, uh, you know, what is it that they'll do in the times to come? Because we've seen that there has been there continues to be rather an attempt to keep driving in that entire two nation theory back, uh, you know, into India, uh, continuously trying to say that there can't be harmony or coexistence or to try to paint India as some Hindu majoritarian country. So if Hindu, if India is a Hindu majoritarian country, why would a UAE then be inviting the Prime Minister of India to inaugurate a Hindu temple? All well, of this is changing and I, are people not you know, how do we ensure that people are understanding the sort of change that is happening globally? Because we allow a lot of very futile narratives uh, uh, to continue on without countering them properly. Well, uh, one example, Devika, and you'll, you know, you'll, you, I think it will be clear to everybody on, uh, on this program. I used to go to Kashmir many, uh, many times during the 1990s and the early 1990s, the entire Kashmiri Pandit community was driven out uh, of large parts of, of Kashmir on the basis of the two nation theory. So two nation theory survived up to, uh, right in the 1990s. Why? Because mainstream Indian politicians from the big parties, like barring a, a few exceptions, I'm happy to say, they continued with this absurd two nation theory. And as far as Kashmir was concerned, they looked the other way. They thought it was perfectly okay that this, well, what happened? I mean, till today, justice has not been done to the Pandit community. The reality of situation is quite frankly, that, you know, you, it is very important to understand that this absurd theory that you have, this two nation theory is not just embraced in India. Don't forget it had its origin in Britain. And now you're seeing that play out in Britain. You have, for example, a, a member of parliament of the, uh, belonging to the Labour Party of the constituency of Rochdale. And this gentleman has said that the attack of October 7 by the, the terrorists of Hamas was basically done by Mossad. Can you believe that? The man is a member of parliament of the British parliament. He has sworn allegiance to the Queen and I mean, and he's a, he's a Briton. He's not uh, from Afghanistan or Somalia or places like that. He said this is a conspiracy by the Jews to make Muslims look bad. Has he read the textbooks of Hamas? I have had uh, studies made of the textbooks that have been taught in Gaza. And I can tell you they spew venom against the Jewish community. They spew hatred against the Jewish community. Textbooks in Pakistan spew hatred against the Hindu community. They say Hindus don't go near them. They're this, they're that. And in Gaza, the textbooks say don't go near Jews. They're this, they're that. This was inevitable under Hamas. And yet, unfortunately, the strongest supporters, all these mass marches and demonstrations in support of Hamas, it doesn't take place in India. 
Yeah, Hindol can be, you know, a little um, more relaxed than that. It takes place in London, in New York, in Washington, uh, in Brussels, in Berlin, uh, in, in Amsterdam, in places like that. This is, a, this is the point. Man against man. Human being against a human being. And unfortunately, let us be honest, this has been tolerated for too long. For too long. This, uh, you know, secularism in India was defined that one group has got to be very submerged and completely, you know, sense, forget about any of its rights. And the other groups could do as they like. And that was secularism. No, everybody has to be treated equally. And that is why the Hindu community, for example, is entitled to its three holy places, Kashi, Mathura and Ayodhya. It is perfectly secular for that. And this understanding of genuine secularism has got to come in our school textbooks, in our secondary textbooks, in our universities, in our books, in our dinner table conversations. And I think it is happening in India. Look at Kashmir today, after the removal of Article 370. Article 370 smelt of the two-nation theory. You go near it, you could get the smell of the two-nation theory in Article 370. And now that smell is gone. And Kashmir is a much more peaceful place. The world, I can tell you, is learning. But unfortunately, the Western world, I'm sorry to say, uh, the Western world has tolerated this kind of thing for so long that the biggest danger now is in the Western world. The biggest da societal danger is within Western society of this kind of fanaticism. And when the rulers of Abu Dhabi, the rulers of Dubai, the rulers of, 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 of uh, Saudi Arabia, of Kuwait, very enlightened people, when they see this, they are determined that their countries will not follow this horrible example. And I think it's something that is completely shared by Prime Minister Modi, who is also a very inclusive, very universal individual who talks about Vasudeva Kutumbakam, who talks about global harmony, who talks about the era of peace, replacing the era of war. And I think this is a wonderful event and this is a wonderful visit by a wonderful Prime Minister and if I may say so, a wonderful counterpart, Sheikh Zayed uh, you know, bin Nayyan of the UAE. Absolutely. I'm going to leave the last word with uh, Hindol and Vedvir Arya. I'm just going to put across uh, you know, the same question. Hindol, beginning with you. We've seen now in the recent few years a bit of a Hindu renaissance, as we like to call it, taking place in India. As that's happening, we now have the UAE, an Islamic nation of the Middle East, celebrating the third largest religion in the world, which is Hinduism. Was this then required to help counter the rise of an anti-Hindu sentiment that has been uh, witnessed in the recent past, especially since the BJP took power in 2014. And are we somewhere then reaching a point where one can celebrate their religion, especially if it's Hinduism, without shame or concern that you will be painted as some Hindu radical who's out there uh, to attack Christians and Muslims and others? There were three things, Devika. Number one, uh, we shouldn't... Um over connect our domestic politics with this uh, i would be skeptical about you know over connecting our domestic politics with this we should see this separately please understand the uae by doing this is also celebrating the diversity that exists already in its society already there are hundreds and thousands of hindus who work there peacefully do not create trouble in that country only contribute to that country help that country grow and progress they are celebrating that diversity also Right. Yes, it is true. What was needed was for India to also celebrate its own culture and not just leave it for somebody else. And for a prime minister to, in a sense, spearhead this all. Right. So all of these things have come together. So I wouldn't overstretch the connection with our domestic politics. That's domestic and that's separate. But yes, we today have a confident nation and a confident prime minister willing to celebrate Indian culture wherever it exists. And indeed, it exists in the UAE. So the UAE is, you know, in a sense, joining hands with us to celebrate the inherent culture of India through this grand temple. Okay. Vedvi Arya, same question to you as well. 
just your perspective on the same. The fact that you have the UAE making this grand gesture, celebrating Hinduism, as Hindol also pointed yes, out, sir. celebrating yeah. the diversity in its own land. Uh, was this then truly necessary to put to rest some of the other narratives, uh, some of the anti-Hindu sentiment, uh, and even to an extent, uh, a narrative of Muslim persecution that was being put out? Yes, Devika, we have been celebrating our uh, the Hinduism since Vaidik era to till arrival of the Britishers or the colonial rulers. It, it's not that just uh, we started a uh, few, 10 years back. Only during the colonial era, colonial masters just, they wanted to rule over us. So they, uh, only those people who uh, just practicing Hinduism is a backwardness or you are not an intellectual. This, due to this kind of a narrative, they created one gated community. Those intellectuals only used to speak in the language of the colonial masters. After the independence also, that post or uh, hangover of the colonialism, so that gated community flourished even last 70 years so Last 10 years, what happened? We just, uh, gate ko hi humne chura liya. Ab, now you can see entire Hinduism is celebrating their existence, their culture, their uh, all temples and everything. So this Rinesa, yes, we can say it's a Rinesa under the great leadership, but this is because Hindu, uh, entire India is secular. Why? It's a naked truth that because Hindus are in majority. Why? Because Hindus celebrate inclusivity as well as the secularism by birth. Okay. Professor Nalapat, same question to you, sir. And the reason why I ask uh, about what is, uh, you know, talking a little bit about what has hap been happening in India as well is simply because a lot of times, one hears and I was recently in a conversation uh, with a few people and uh, you know they were talking about how they saw uh, orange flags in their neighborhood uh, ahead of the Ram Mandir inauguration and they said oh it, it, uh, it, you know, it felt a little bit scary and the moment I asked them really why did orange flags scare you, they're simply flags, uh, nobody really had a response. It's because people are talking and reading uh, you know, b narratives in what seems to be a bubble, whereas what is happening in the world is very different. And that's why I said it's important for us to then have very clear conversations because it is important to recognize and appreciate the fact that the mandir is being inaugurated in the UAE, that that step has been taken by the Emiratis to finally uh, acknowledge and celebrate the diversity and the value that Indians, uh, that the Indian community brings to their land. Devika, go by mathematical statistics. Go by the statistics you find uh, across the world and, you know, and find out a community which has got the lowest per capita rate of crime and you will find they are Sanatanis. Uh, the lowest rate of crime, the best respect for law and order. And that is why Sanatanis are welcome across the world. And, you know, the, 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 the tragedy, unfortunately, is that the Sino-Wahhabi lobby. Now, some of us have been talking about this lobby for decades and nobody took us seriously. But now I'm glad to say more and more people are taking it very, very seriously. There has been an organized effort to paint the Hindu community in the most horrible of colors. And, you know, that they are hateful people, that they are backward people, as uh, Dr. Arya was, was saying. And it came to a, a level in which in partic one particular government, I don't want to talk about it, but in one particular government, secret instructions were given that any official of a, above a certain rank who used to have, you know, a, 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 a sindur or, 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 or some a, a, a mark on, on his forehead or her forehead, and who used to visit the temple more than once a month, one, more than once a month visit a temple, he had to be identified as a quote-unquote Hindu fanatic, as an RSS man. As a, uh, why? Because, then, you know, I mean, if everybody who goes to a temple more than once a month is an RSS man, the RSS would have 500 million members, I'd like to say. But this was the absurdity. And this narrative is still there across the world. And unfortunately, many of our people, they look at the narrative of, as, as has correctly been said, this gated community. 
and this gated community is not only in india it come it's very active in the western world it's an import of the western world like the two nation theory was and they only take take that seriously oh if you're an indian and you say some i mean you know in the case of some some of us some of us who you know give concepts and and write books we were never taken seriously until in the western world we were taken seriously and then lo and behold suddenly we taken seriously in india as well so this is the tragedy the slave mentality as has correctly been said by both hindol and vedveer that slave mentality was so embedded the british left but the slave mentality they embedded took a long time to go and i'd like to say from 2014 onwards it has been going and today in my view this but great event is a sign that has finally gone from the indian psyche all communities it has gone from the indian psyche the people i saw you know, on, on 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 video in that uh, in that audience of 60000 they are people who are confident who are uh, very confident of the future very very confident of themselves the kind of confidence that narendra modi had in his future when he was a very underprivileged young man and with no prospects whatsoever that you could discover but he was confident and look where he is today acknowledged across the world that same confidence i'm seeing in these tens of thousands of faces in that stadium irrespective of religion irrespective of caste irrespective of region that's the greatness and the greatness of of india of bharat i can tell you and that greatness is something appreciated across the world right absolutely hindol bringing you back into the conversation there uh, you know quite interesting and i just want you to uh, share your thoughts on what uh, on the same question that i've asked professor nalapat as well the only reason i understand and uh, i'm also not suggesting that we should uh, link what happens domestically in india as far as the hindu muslim narrative is concerned with what's happening in the uae but it becomes somewhere important to then appreciate it acknowledge it and also understand how is it that one can then use it effectively to understand the shift that is taking place in global politics in the world versus the sort of narratives that are fed to people still in india and what is it that can be done to counter it effectively if we begin on a lighter note devika by saying that um, if you are hanging out with people who are scared of orange <laughs> flags uh, may i humbly say that perhaps those friends of yours will be you know scared for a long long time and one doesn't want anybody to be scared so kindly tell your friends not to be scared of a color on a flag uh, but that was just in a lighter vein but let me just say i think you've asked a very interesting question the world is changing um you know the transition from fossil fuels will create a lot of geopolitical churn uh, there's already geopolitical churn happening because you know america is in decline uh, you know the chinese situation we don't know we will find out in the years to come what chinese growth really meant and so on and so forth and of course there is a lot of anticipation that india as a rising power and hopefully india will be a great power sooner rather than later will balance out many of these things we have to balance out many of these things the coming of this temple should be seen through many many lenses one of course is hinduism's own confidence and resurgence which you've been talking about also from a geopolitical lens the middle east today wants to make this claim and proclaim that it is a far more inclusive space than has been traditionally thought that transition is already happening uh, not least because its populations are so diverse the last point that i want to make is you know the last pockets of radicalism in fact today are in south asia and the country that Pro professor nalapat mentioned there are more radicals today and i would not be surprised if this is true there are more radicals today in london than there are in dubai or abu dhabi this is the honest truth there in fact there are more radicals in london um, and and in parts of europe than there are in riyadh so you know 
that this radicalization actually is impacting the West, uh, even as the even as the Middle East pushes this out of its sort of ecosystem. And the West is where another problem has already begun. And you will see this grow much worse in the years to come. Uh, India will have to grapple with all of these things. We don't have a choice. So therefore, the more confident we get, the more confident our economy becomes and stronger it becomes, the better we will be able to handle it. But we won't be able to handle it by being on the defensive about our own culture all the time. Right, absolutely. Professor Nalapath, and the reason why I, I raise this issue is simply because, you know, I was trying to look at... Uh, uh, at some of our, you know, the New York Times, the Washington Post and all, most of them are honestly not even covering the Prime Minister's visit to the UAE, which is understandable. But those who are have focused on the fact that it's his seventh visit to the UAE, which is home to millions of Indians. But there's not a word about the temple that is being inaugurated. Look, the fact is that uh, I'm, I'm quite surprised that... Uh, uh, you know, someone with, with your IQ would take the New York Times seriously. New York Times, Washington Post... No, I don't uh, take them seriously at all, sir. I, I'm, but, glad, I'm but, glad you do. But, but, but to, be, to be fair, there is a large read, readership, and that's why that, that's simply why, just talking about countering narratives, on that note, I asked the question. Yeah, I'd like to say that facts basically need to be presented clearly, and I think the point is that you know, if your one's self-confidence is growing and the facts are being presented. For example, the facts relating to the forced the genocide of the Pandit community in Kashmir, the genocide of mostly of Hindus and other uh, Bengalis uh, in, in, in what was at that point in time East Pakistan. Hardly anybody talks about it. They talk about imaginary genocides in India and ignore real genocides. And this is what has happened as a result of the indoctrination of lobbies. And, this, and these particular lobbies, they don't just want you to believe that countries like China, Pakistan, radicals, authoritarian are very lovely countries. They want you to hate your own country. They want Indians to hate India. They want the British to hate Britain. They want the Americans to hate America. And guess what? in many sections of the population, much more in Britain and America than in India, thank God, they are succeeding. You have a whole group of Indians who hate other Indians simply for being Indian. So I would only like to say, uh, they, this is a narrative that we have all of us, each of us got to fight. And I compliment NewsX, I compliment you for, uh, for, for taking up this narrative and for ensuring that Satya Meva Jayate. Absolutely. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.